I'm Jennifer Byrne, Director of Anti-Slavery Australia at the University of Technology in Sydney. I'm very pleased to be part of this online global counter-trafficking conference and wholeheartedly endorse the aims of the conference to develop partnerships and collaboration with the aim of preventing child trafficking and responding to those children who have experienced trafficking. In my presentation, I would like to outline something briefly about Anti-Slavery Australia, to talk about the Australian system of government and the legislative scheme as it impacts on the development of anti-trafficking initiatives. I'll speak about some major Australian cases and then talk about some of the gaps in the Australian response to trafficking. And primarily, we have found that the major gap is in the area of forced and servile marriage. And I'll come to that later. So we, Anti-Slavery Australia, was developed in 2003 at the University of Technology, Sydney. We are unique, being a, a human rights and advocacy group based in a university in Australia. We conduct research, we do a lot of advocacy, and we include a legal service providing legal advice and representation to men, women and children who have been trafficked into Australia or who have experienced slavery, forced labour or forced marriage. We are a member of the Australian Government National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery and we work with many organisations in Australia, including the Australian Human Rights Commission, many civil society organisations and international groups such as the Australian Red Cross. In our work, we prioritise the human rights of the trafficked person and ensure that in everything that we do, that the human rights of trafficked people are at the centre of all our initiatives to support trafficked people and our research initiatives that are directed at uh, prevention of trafficking and slavery. So we work within a human rights framework and uh, that has been characteristic of everything that we've done over the last uh, 10 years. I wanted to briefly um, mention something about the Australian uh, system of government and our legal system because uh, that impacts on anti-slavery and anti-trafficking initiatives. So um, Australia is a very big continent. Um, we have 23 million people here. We have a constitutional monarchy. So the Commonwealth of Australia, the Australian Government, is a constitutional monarchy. And the Constitution establishes the Commonwealth Government and sets out the powers of the Commonwealth Government to legislate. We have a system of federalism as well, and power is divided and shared between the Commonwealth and six Australian states. And the consequence is that the Australian government, the Commonwealth of Australia, can make laws, and each of the six Australian states can also make laws um, in respect of a whole range of activities. In some areas, uh, power to legislate is reserved for the Commonwealth, and in some areas, that power is shared. But there are, there are con consequences on the development of the Australian response to trafficking and slavery, and I'll, I'll come back to those. Importantly, um, Australia hosted a visit by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on trafficking in persons in November 2011. And 
the UN Special Rapporteur Joy Azilo, who's also speaking at this seminar, um, presented a report to the General Assembly in June 2012. She noted that Australia is a destination country for men, women and children trafficked to Australia primarily from the Asia Pacific region. The majority of people who have been identified as being trafficked have been uh, women and men trafficked from Thailand, the Republic of Korea, Malaysia, China, the Philippines and other countries in the Asia Pacific region. The majority of people trafficked to Australia have been trafficked into sexual exploitation, but there is an increasing number of uh, reports of trafficking in, in other areas as well, particularly the vulnerable groups of uh, people trafficked into hospitality, in construction and in, into agriculture. We also see uh, an emerging issue which is the use of uh, visas for trafficking into Australia uh, girls and women through the marriage visa system and we are also becoming more alert to the broader issue of forced marriage. And in Australia we treat forced marriage as a slavery-like practice in line with the 1956 Supplementary Convention on Slavery. It's also characteristic of the pattern of slavery and trafficking in Australia that those who experience these abuses are generally not physically restrained, but rather restrained through invisible bonds of coercion and psychological oppression. People who have been identified as being trafficked um, will report that they have been threatened, that they fear violence, that they sometimes believe that they have a large debt that they have to pay off. So the invisible chains of control are just as effective in the Australian context as a physical chain, a physical bond that has historically restrained slaves, historically restrained people who have been trafficked into Australia. When the rapporteur reported on Australia, she noted that there was a lack of data on child trafficking in Australia. While Australia is a large island surrounded by water and is a long way away from everywhere, we, we, um, we do have very strict immigration controls and it can be difficult uh, for children to be brought into the country without parents or legal guardians. You know, without some awareness from our Department of Immigration. However, there have been reported cases of child trafficking that have taken place within Australia and they are an issue of concern. And there is also an issue of trafficking of children through marriage and that is where the children are, are under the age of 18. The international framework in Australia is that Australia has ratified the, the, the key uh, international instrument dealing with trafficking being the protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children. We are also a signatory to many other international instruments and at the heart of those instruments there is a concern to protect the human rights and the dignity of men, women and children, but particularly children. And we see that in, in all these instruments and notably, of course, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There is little data on trafficking in Australia. We are a destination country. There has been a uh, whole of government response to trafficking since 2004. And in the period 2004 to June this year, 17 people were convicted of trafficking, slavery, 
and sexual servitude offences in Australia. There are matters before the courts and other matters are still under appeal. The Australian Federal Police conducted over 390 assessments and investigations during that time period. For any person who has been identified as being trafficked, there is an Australian Government funded support program and a, and a visa program for those who might need a visa. Um, importantly, um, the support program is dependent on an assessment by the Australian Federal Police that a person, including a child, is a suspected victim of human trafficking. So the Australian Federal Police are the gatekeepers for the support program and there will not be support unless there is an AFP determination that a person may be a suspected victim of trafficking. The initial period of reflection is known as a bridging F visa and that lasts for a period of 45 days. That visa isn't always necessary, but if a person is identified as being trafficked, then they will be entitled to support, including intensive case work support, uh, assistance with accommodation, with money, food accommodation, health services, legal advice and so on, for a period of 45 days. After that, there will be additional visas available, but only if there is a contribution to a law enforcement process. Commentators such as the Special Rapporteur uh, considered the relatively low number of reported cases of trafficking in Australia. And this has been an academic interest and a research interest at the Australian Institute of Criminology too. There is some agreement that the reasons for uh, a lack of identification of people who may be experienced trafficking and trafficking related crimes can be due to a lack of awareness of the rights and services available, a lack of information available in appropriate multilingual formats, Importantly, uh, a mistrust of authority and uh, government organisations, a fear of deportation, a fear of other kind of harm, and a fear of threats to themselves and to their family. Additionally, people who experience trafficking in Australia are often coerced and subject to physical and psychological violence. More needs to be done to raise awareness about trafficking and related crime in Australia and to raise awareness about the supports that are available to assist those who have experienced trafficking. Trafficking and slavery are crimes in Australia. Slavery has been a crime since 1824 through the effect of various uh, historic um, legislative schemes. Slavery has been a specific offence in the Criminal Code since 1999 and uh, trafficking in persons offences were introduced to, into Australian law in 2005. Specialist visas became available in 2004. Australia has also um, had a lead in developing offences that uh, will criminalise child sex tourism when Australians go overseas to engage in that activity. So we have uh, extraterritoriality uh, built into our criminal law system and Australians will be charged and penalised under Australian law if they do engage in child sex tourism overseas. This year in 2013, Australia enacted an important new suite of laws addressing servitude, forced labour, forced marriage, organ trafficking. 
and expanding the definition of coercion in Australian law. The process that led to this amendment um, was one of um, intensive consultation uh, in response to an Australian government discussion paper from 2010. And there were clear gaps in the law um, that were apparent to, to the judiciary, to law enforcement, to organisations and to researchers. Now, importantly, the trafficking offences uh, were complicated, um, difficult to investigate, and indeed of the 17 convictions to date, only two of those have been for human trafficking offences. The remainder have been for slavery or sexual servitude. So the inclusion of new offences of servitude and forced labour, particularly important. And uh, this, uh, this particular law, as you can see, is called the Crimes Legislation Amendment, Slavery, Slavery-like Conditions and People Trafficking Act came into effect on International Women's Day this year. And I do believe uh, as a consequence that uh, gaps in the criminal law will be filled by the provisions in this new legislative scheme. Uh, and I would expect that there would be more people identified as having experienced human trafficking or forced labour in Australia. In 2008, the Australian High Court um, handed down a decision in the landmark case of the Queen and Tang. This case interpreted the slavery provisions in the Australian Criminal Code. And importantly, uh, the Chief Justice at that time said that it is important not to debase the currency of language or to banalise crimes against humanity by giving slavery a meaning that extends beyond the 1926 Convention. The court said clearly that it's important to distinguish between harsh and exploitative work conditions and the crime of slavery. But essentially, um, the power to deal with a person as though they were just a commodity uh, to treat them as an object of sale and purchase may be indications of slavery and indications of slavery as opposed to harsh uh, conditions of employment. Now, the slavery um, provision um, is set out here and the court said that there were four powers that were um, similar to powers that may be exercised um, over a, a person if slavery um, was permitted, which it's not. So the power to make a person an object of sale and purchase, to use their labour and not to pay them and to restrict their, their movements and to res restrict their decisions. This is an important case for Australian jurisprudence and it's one that moved beyond older interpretations of chattel slavery to uh, incorporate um, modern understandings of slavery. In this case, uh, the defence uh, lawyers argued that uh, the witnesses weren't truly enslaved because they could run away. They were not physically restrained. But the trial judge, uh, McInerney, said how could they run away when they had no money, they had no passport or ticket, uh, they had limited English, they had no friends, they were told to avoid immigration and they believed that they had a large debt to pay off. So this is incorporating um, understandings of modern day slavery and that is now part of the Australian jurisprudence uh, on slavery. We have specific offences in our criminal code that deal with children. It's important to note though that the offences of slavery and servitude and forced labour apply to any person, whether they're a man, a woman or a child. But in addition, um, there are specific offences of child trafficking. 
it's also important to note that where um, the crime of slavery or servitude or forced labour is committed against a child, there will be an extra penalty because the offence is taken to be an aggravated penalty. The offences of child trafficking um, are set out in the Commonwealth Criminal Code and we've referenced those there and these are available in the PowerPoints. They are quite complicated and the elements of the offences are complicated. So in summary, uh, there is very little uh, information available about the nature or scope of child trafficking in Australia. From the information that is available, um, it's apparent that child trafficking is most often associated with ex ex sexual exploitation uh, and possibly uh, forced marriage. In terms of support and protection, there are specific prevention strategies in place for children, but more needs to be done there. And it would be better if in Australia we did develop um, specific guidelines that related to children as separate from uh, adult men and women. So we do have uh, some guidelines that were developed uh, through the National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery. These are important guidelines that set out you know, human rights concerns and human rights best practice for any NGO working with a person who's been trafficked into Australia. And there are sections in the guidelines that do uh, relate to children. But nevertheless, um, there is a need for guidelines of greater depth um, that's, uh, that are multi-agency that apply across all the Australian states and to the Commonwealth. Now, one of the issues that we've seen um, is that there is a clear need for an effective remedy for any person who's been trafficked into Australia, including children. Although we have criminal laws that address slavery and trafficking, we don't have a national compensation scheme that would pay, um, make a financial payment to a child or a man or a woman who has experienced these crimes in Australia. Rather, each of the states and territories has its own compensation scheme and the consequences we have eight different compensation schemes and there are different time limits that apply in each one. There are different thresholds. There are different um, compensable um, harms and there are different payments. So that is not um, an effective response for a Commonwealth crime and we are maintaining our advocacy to ensure that there will be the establishment of a national compensation scheme for victims of slavery and trafficking in Australia. The Australian Human Rights Commission uh, reflects the concerns around lack of reporting and available data. Additionally, they raise the issue of um, unaccompanied minors. Most often uh, we see unaccompanied minors in Australia who have come to Australia uh, as asylum seekers to seek protection in Australia. It's not clear what the screening mechanisms are to ensure that um, unaccompanied minors have not also been trafficked into Australia. The Human Rights Commission said that there are a lack of detailed guidelines and there needs to be more support for uh, children who have been trafficked. Importantly, as I've said, the support program currently is dependent uh, essentially on a contribution to law enforcement. So beyond an initial reflection period where any person identified as being trafficked will be supported, anything beyond that time 
is dependent on assisting assistance to the Australian Federal Police or police in a state or territory. The Australian Human Rights Commission recommends that children victims of trafficking um, are supported to a higher degree and should be relieved of the need to participate in a law enforcement uh, investigation. So um, when the UN Rapporteur came to Australia, she also uh, referred to the risk of unaccompanied minors being trafficked or misidentified. Um, that those who are not identified as trafficked may be, sub may be um, subject to immigration detention depending on their circumstances. And the rapporteur recommended that there be the development of specialist services for children that include housing, legal services, medical services, education and importantly family reunification. Currently, um, children who uh, are unaccompanied have a guardian who is the Minister for Immigration. The Australian Human Rights Commission and the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking uh, recommend that the guardian be independent um, of, of government. So uh, we need to have um, more specialist services developed. Um, to ensure that uh, children who may be trafficked are identified and de the development of these services um, will go towards reflecting the best interests of the child and supporting children who have been trafficked. We do need to look to uh, establishing an independent guardian for children who have been identified as being trafficked to ensure that the interests and the human rights of trafficked children are protected. And that um, if there is doubt about the age of a child, then they sh there should be a presumption that they are a child rather than a young adult and uh, accorded appropriate protections. So, Unaccompanied minors uh, face special vulnerabilities. They are often isolated in Australia. They are um, alone, obviously. They don't have family support. They don't have community support. And they may be misidentified when they really are a victim of human trafficking. And this is uh, an element of concern to the Australian Human Rights Commission, UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking and other researchers. I would now like to give some examples of cases where children have been trafficked in Australia and to describe briefly uh, the response to that experience. Um, the first case uh, involves uh, the trafficking of a 13-year-old girl from Thailand to Australia in 1995. She uh, believed that she was coming to Australia to work as a nanny. Rather, uh, on arrival, um, she was uh, sexually exploited and believed that she was in a situation of debt bondage. She was working in a brothel and the brothel was raided by the Department of Immigration. She was detained under the Australian uh, Migration Act and um, eventually removed to Thailand. At this time in 1995, there was no response to trafficking. Um, rather, the Australian Migration Act requires that um, any person in Australia without a visa uh, would be, should be um, detained until they can be removed as soon as possible. Um, this uh, young girl later assisted Thai authorities and there were arrests in Thailand. Um, in 2007, um, very well respected um, Melbourne Queen's Council, Fiona McLeod, um, 
put forward a case for victims' compensation for this um, young woman who had been a child when she was trafficked into Australia. And this was the first case where there had been uh, an award of uh, payment under a statutory scheme in Australia. But you can see from these facts that she was not identified as trafficked um, and she was not identified as a person um, whose rights should be respected uh, as, as, as a child. In another case, uh, in, um, in another case, there was a domestic trafficking case where um, parents were advertising the services of their 12-year-old daughter. Um, so they were um, facilitating sexual services. Um, she, was a, she was working in sexual servitude and sexual exploitation. This case was not seen um, as a trafficking case. Um, it was not seen as a slavery case in Australian law. This year, in 2013, there, is, there has been the first conviction under Australian child trafficking laws. This case uh, involved a girl um, who had Australian residency eventually, who was brought to Australia from Thailand and um, who worked in sexual exploitation. Uh, her, her mother and partner and others were arrested and um, her mother was charged under both Queensland state law and also Commonwealth law, uh, specifically trafficking in children and there was a conviction there. This is the first case in Australia where there has been a conviction for child trafficking. Of the 17 convictions so far, there have only been two for trafficking and the others have been for uh, slavery and sexual servitude. We are seeing in Australia uh, an emerging interest and concern in the area of forced marriage. Forced marriage was criminalised this year in 2013 and we have offences in our criminal code that um, criminalise conduct forcing a person into a forced marriage. We've seen a number of cases in Australia where Australian girls um, have um, sought protection of the Family Court of Australia from being removed from Australia for marriage, for the purpose of marriage overseas. In one example, a 17-year-old girl, Australian girl, contacted the police to say that um, her mother was making arrangements for her marriage outside Australia and she asked the police for help. Um, this case resulted in an order being made by the court, family court, that she would be placed on the airport watch list and that her, pa her passport would be surrendered to the court, that she would not be allowed to leave Australia until she turned 18. In another case, there was a 14-year-old girl who was reportedly being uh, prepared for marriage outside Australia. In that case, uh, which also went to the family court, the court ordered the prevention um, or ordered that she not be removed from Australia and made orders in relation to her passport. So this is another case involving an Australian national who was being taken outside Australia for the purpose of early forced marriage. In the, the final of these examples, um, there is this case of Crete and Sampir not their real names, where a girl who was 17 was deceived into travelling overseas um, to marry a man that her parents had chosen for her. She was subject to coercion and duress, so her parents threatened to have her Australian boyfriends, mother and sisters, kidnapped and raped unless she married 
the man of their choice. She did marry him and she came back to Australia and um, asked the court to annul the marriage. The court said, yes, the marriage should be annulled because there was no real consent. Um, she had been subject to duress. Her will had been overborne. There was no marriage. But these, these are examples of an increased awareness around early and forced marriage. And there is little research into this specialist area. But it is one um, that is important and one that requires a, a special response, especially where children, children are involved. And that would include you know, the development of effective guidelines uh, for multiple agencies, um, better awareness in the community around forced marriage, but importantly, greater engagement with communities um, to raise awareness in each com community about forced marriage. Forced marriage is now a crime in Australia, but it is also a community issue and prevention is the best strategy and particularly so uh, in the very difficult cases um, of forced marriage that we, that we have been seeing. In terms of best practice generally, there is a need for more research into trial, child trafficking, better coordination between the Commonwealth and state agencies. There needs to be greater training of frontline government officers so that those children who are identified are more likely um, to be supported, firstly identified and then supported. Um, we need to have greater uh, awareness in our community and better services for children, specialised and comprehensive services for children, special housing arrangements, good education, good legal advice and holistic case support. If a child has been trafficked, we want to help them unite with their families and we want to provide them with visa support. In the area of forced marriage, we would like to be exploring civil remedies in addition to the crime of forced marriage. And we look forward to working um, with other agencies and the Australian government in developing the Australian Government Action Plan to respond to human trafficking and slavery that will come into effect from 2014. I would like to thank you again um, for inviting me to speak in this online conference. I think it is historic and it's a great opportunity for us all to collaborate, to meet, to develop links and to work globally to prevent trafficking and to support children who have been trafficked. Thank you.